I hope you all are as excited as I am. This may just be the beginning of a conversation, but a conversation that should happen and continue until we finally solve this problem once and for all. So thank you so much for coming. This is the first ever Waltham Community Leadership Group Housing Forum. Also, if anyone needs any uh, listening devices to help out, we have plenty of headsets here. They're right over here on the side of the table, so feel free. Uh, right there in the back of the room. Hey, Monique, could you, there's someone oh, right sure. back. Could you raise your hand okay. if you might need one? We'll have someone bring them around. Okay. This has been quite the process in getting this together, getting it all going, um, keeping it going, and bringing all of you here. I can't thank you enough for coming. I know this is not just an issue that faces people who are unhoused, which I myself currently am and have faced this off and on for years. It's an issue that affects all of us. Whether it's happening to you or has ever happened to you, maybe it will never happen to you, I hope it doesn't. But it still affects every single one of us. So our primary topic here is housing. Even though there are many different issues that go into our lives. So there are a number of people here who are unhoused. I myself right now am one of them. That problem should be solved for me quickly, but it's still happening now. So this has been uh, quite an effort, especially on the part of those of us who are facing this and trying to solve it for everyone so that it never happens to any of you. Um, but in all honesty, we are all one bad day away from being destitute, being on the streets, not having help. My ex-husband said to me one day, um, his mother was facing a lot of mental health issues, and he looked at my husband and said, you know the difference between our mother and the people who are out here on the street, they lived in San Francisco? And he said, what? He said, our mother has us. She has a built-in support network to make sure that her mental health issues and any other issues don't mean she ends up on the street. The support network can't just come from friends and family. It has to come from <coughs> all of us. We have to see ourselves in each other, have the empathy and the understanding that we are, many people are one paycheck away but it doesn't matter who you are. We're all one bad day away from potentially being in a situation that once you get down there, it's very, very, very hard to climb out. I myself have experienced this off and on for seven years now. I grew up in a good family. I have seven years of college under my belt, an amazing, work history and resume, and I'm still going through this. So I hope today that you will hear the stories of everyone who comes up, and you can see yourself in them. You can see them in you, because I am you and you are me. We are in this together. I cannot thank you enough for coming. This is not the end of anything, this is the very beginning. And we need to make sure that all of the momentum, everything that we start today, we keep going with each other. And even though this is the first ever Waltham Community Leadership Group Housing Forum, it probably won't be the last, but let's hope that some of the consecutive meetings, we finally end this once and for all. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers today. So we have you set up in kind of
kind of little pods of four, if you can notice that. So we'll bring that up in just a moment. We're going to do some audience engagement. Uh, there should be at least one person in each of these groups that's from the Waltham Community Leadership Group. Um, Jill's going to come up and give a very brief history of how it started, what we're made of, but it's comprised of... Oh. <laughs> It's comprised of both the unhoused community and plenty of the house community, our um, fellow nonprofits and organizations that are here to help us all out. In the initial group of stories that you're going to hear today, I hope you can find things, even if you have not experienced any of this yourself, I hope you can find something in there that you can identify with. <coughs> or at least to identify with that person so that you can see yourself as a part of humanity. You can see yourself as me and know that this can happen to anyone. There are a lot of issues that are going on in our society with each and every one of us. And Honestly, there are a lot of times when people who have never experienced this or any significant hardship, they can blame homelessness on mental health or substance abuse. Just go get a job. In most communities, significant portion of the unhoused community, they do have jobs. And it's really hard. It's really, really, really hard. Sorry, I knew I wasn't going to be able to get through this without crying. What you're going to find out today is that there are communities, there are cities and towns and states and countries that have annihilated this problem, the housing problem. Get a roof over your head. In those communities, there are still mental health issues. There is still substance abuse. There are still all of these other issues that we need to address. Lack of transportation, health care, lack of support. Um, but if we can come together and annihilate this problem once and for all, we can be more ready to attack all of those other problems, and we will be together doing it. So thank you so, so very much for coming. It means the world to me, and I hope you do feel as much a part of this community as I do. Um, so the Waltham Community Leadership Group started in 2019. I'd like to bring Jill up for just a moment to give a brief history of that. Uh, she was, is one of our founding members, among others. Monique is here, where is she? Oh, yeah. Right yeah. Yeah. Monique, one of our founding members. We've got Hoosty in the back, I can see. Is that who I'm seeing? Yeah. Yes. Um, we all can't make it every single week, but there's always a thread of us that continues, and we communicate and keep that thread going so that a very important grassroots organization that we're not getting paid. <laughs> this, is, this is a product of our love and our effort and our willingness to come together, to be humble, admit our own issues, but also come with the strengths and everything that we have to put towards solving this problem. Um, I'd like to bring Jill up for just a moment. I said she's one of my favorite people in this world and one of the founding members of the Waltham Community Leadership Group. I thought she could give a much better brief history of how it all came together and what it's done. Executive director.
director and a chaplain, a chaplain's on the way. Um, it happens all the time, uh, what's happening to me right now, which is I couldn't say it better than Melody already did. <laughs> so I'll just be uh, as brief as I can be. It's true that chaplains on the way helped set up the very first uh, Waltham Community Leadership Group meeting back in 2019, and some key people were here. I was here at the time as a student chaplain, believe it or not, so I can hardly take credit, but I showed up for the meetings and was amazed to see that little seed group turn into what it is today. It's grown into its own freestanding organization, which was always the intent, I believe, and Chaplains on the Way just supports it, and we're members of it as chaplains, and we rely on it for a lot of guidance about what we do at Chaplains on the Way. Um, as Melody said, the leadership group is open to housed and unhoused people. I hope uh, some of you in the room will drop in the next Tuesday meeting and maybe become a regular. Um, but it's always led by people who have lived experience, personal experience, with homelessness and housing insecurity. So it's, it's an amazing group. I'm bragging about it all the time. It's like, if you want to see democracy work, if you want to see grassroots activism work, come to a leadership group meeting. It is unbelievable to see how patient and resilient people are. And we're talking about a group of people who are facing a lot of folks in the room, a lot of other really difficult challenges, and yet I think the leadership group does democracy better and does a civil uh, like commitment to community uh, goals better than any other group I've ever been a part of. So I'm just so proud of it. I'm so proud to be part of it. It's had a lot of successes. One that I will mention uh, is early in COVID when the house community was experiencing what people call the lockdown. I mean, the idea was stay in your home, and that's how we keep each other safe from COVID. Well, what does that mean if you do not have a home? If you're in a shelter, or you're sleeping in a tent, or using the ATM for shelter, when the lockdown happened, the library was closed, McDonald's was closed, everything was closed. And among other things, that meant even if you were in the shelter at night during the day when it was 20 degrees and snowing and sleeting, you had no place to go to be inside. And beyond that, I want everyone in the room to think about this for a minute, there was no place to go to the bathroom. And so that was an issue that the leadership group took on really boldly. And, and that lead, some of you may remember this, your Waltham residents, the leadership group worked with all the relevant bodies involved to make sure that there were porta potties in front of the library. And they might not have looked very nice compared to how beautiful Waltham generally is, but it really mattered for people's lives and their dignity. So that's a success I want to lift up. There have been many, many others. The leadership group is looking to bring everybody in Waltham together. And obviously, the fact that we are gathered together in this room, I can barely talk about it without choking up because this is a success of the leadership group. This is amazing. Maybe we can clap. I wasn't going to speak at all, but Melody said, no, come up and say something. So I just want to say on behalf of the leadership group, which I'm a very proud member of as a chaplain, and on behalf of Chaplains on the Way, uh, just so happy you're here. Welcome. Let's get to work. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Like she said, um, so the community leadership group meets every Tuesday morning at, is it 9 or 9.30? 9.30, okay, right, 9.30. Um, you're welcome to come as often or as infrequently as you would like. We would love to have uh, your ears, your eyes, your opinion. If we don't like your opinion, we'll vote you off the island. <laughs> totally kidding. Um, that also being said, I've been through a lot, especially in the past few months in trying to plan this. So as your designated MC, if I screw up, please don't vote me off the island. <laughs> we have a very exciting lineup of speakers. The first half of the evening will be our, well, not all of them are unhoused now, but they've all experienced it. We wanted to get everyone on the same page so that we can all start to hear and understand and feel what other people are going through, hear stories and circumstances that you may not even realize exist. 
within people's lives. There are many opinions when people say, you know, if you're homeless, go get a job. Go to the doctor. Stop doing drugs. I don't do drugs. <laughs> I, you know, I work. I always have, and it's still happening to me. So I really hope you can open yourself up and you learn something new that you never realized existed. A lot of people think when you're homeless, you can just go to a shelter. They'll take you in. Go get housing. They'll give you housing. I've been on the housing list since 2016. I gave up on that. I might as well just do it myself. But there are options, and our goal here today is to not just understand what's going on, but to come up with the solutions, and like I said, continue this conversation until we solve this problem, and then we don't have to. The goal, really, honestly, for me, is to never have to have another housing forum, because we've solved it. If we want to have other forums on other issues, let's move it forward. Uh, so we have a lot of different people in our midst today. Um, is Raise your hand if you are a resident of Waltham. Here. Okay, wonderful. So everybody's engaged in that. Um, raise your hand if you're part of our political community. Wonderful, wonderful, thank you so much. Raise your hand if you're concerned about the housing crisis. Here. That's what brings us all together. You'll hear a lot of the issues that are going on, and after we have a short break, we will come back with a lot of our experts, people in the nonprofit community and within government and other organizations that are helping this. So we are hoping today to not just present the problem, the issue, but present a lot of ideas that maybe we all haven't heard together. And we all need to be get together when we hear this so we're on the same page in solving this. Let's see, like I told you, I've been through a lot, so I hope I'm not missing anything. Um, one thing I did want to mention was that, okay, um, there's a lot of empirical evidence that shows that in communities where they've solved the housing problem, they've made affordable housing, shelters that are available and safe, they may still have the mental health problems and lack of um, employment, uh, substance abuse, but when you solve the actual problem of getting a roof over someone's head, you can start knocking everything else out. So this is not a problem that has to continue and it shouldn't. We are all obviously pretty intelligent human beings because I've got everyone's attention in this room and I see those open eyes and open hearts. I thank you for that. So, without further ado, we are going to have just a quick moment. Um, if you can kind of notice, your chairs are in little pods of four. So some of you aren't in full pods in the back. We might have some of you in the back just kind of joined together. But just real quickly, if you can see your pot of four, turn to the people and just introduce yourself, tell them who you are, we'll take just a moment to do that. <laughs> actually slightly in the form of our Waltham Community Leadership Group meetings. So we also, in addition to the chalice lighting, will be doing some <coughs> opening words. At the end, we will do some closing words. I hope they move you as much as they move me every time I hear them. So without further ado, KJ is going to give us the opening statement and light our chalice for us. 
lagging behind and it's the business of homelessness that I don't like. Because, um, you know, there was a homeless task force and uh, it's funny because there was nobody homeless on the task force. I think that's ironic and that's another reason why I started this group is because I wanted us to have a seat at the table. I mean, granted, you know, um, uh, you know, we need help, uh, but we don't need every single decision. We want to have input in our own lives. And also we want to have a show, a good faith effort that we're, uh, just a small effort that we're, we're helping ourselves to. We don't want a handout, you know? Um, and uh, that's why we have the cleanup once a year too, and barbecues and stuff. And um, also, like I said in my video, um, there's a lot of great organizations, uh, Community Day Center, there's people in the police department, um, there's uh, uh, chaplains on the way, there's community leadership group, but there's no bridges, two-way bridges going back and forth. So what I think that should be done um, although we were talking about this the other day, people compete for funding. But, you know, we really need to get people out here that will go out <coughs> into the field. And sometimes you literally need to take somebody's hand, literally, and help them. I'm going through that right now. Somebody at the day center is helping me. Um, and. Uh, so, because I literally needed to be taken by the hand, I had some problems and I was starting to spiral. Um, also, uh, uh, people named, uh, I don't know if you know Penguin, his name is David. He, um, he had somebody helping him and then they moved out of Waltham. But uh, my good friend Mickey has sort of taken over as his caseworker. But she does not get paid for that. Now, I'm not saying she should, but that's what we need. We literally need more caseworkers. Not a piece of paper that has a list of shelters on it. Um, I ran into people who were uh, given Alzheimer's, who uh, were given a, a piece of paper, you know? And um, when mistakes are made, um, it keeps us out there longer. So a mistake that seems maybe no big deal because it's a piece of paper, is somebody's life on here. And I don't think that's what a lot of people, I have a prejudice against, you know, cops and social workers. I was born into the system. So I have a bias. I'd like to get rid of that bias, you know? So um, I guess that's all for right now. Thank you. Thank you so much to Monique. Like she pointed out, one of our wonderful founding members. Um, couldn't have done it without her. I love that girl. Next up, we have KJ. Woo! KJ! A lot of people know me. I'm not the greatest. What's your name? Public speaking. Kevin Robertson? No. <laughs> KJ. Kevin Robertson. Call me it. It doesn't matter. What is your ID? Uh, a lot of people know me, I'm not the greatest at public speaking, so I'm gonna try to make this quick and carry this along. Um, um, I grew up in Waltham, played Waltham youth sports. At the age of 12, I was diagnosed with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. It led me down a horrible road of addiction, which eventually led to me not being able to play sports. I did graduate high school, luckily, but uh, ended up Graduating, not knowing where to go, being a drug addict, falling into drugs, getting arrested, um, getting kicked out, being homeless for 10 years, living on the streets. I used to sleep in the woods, in the garages, anywhere I could find out of the wind. Don't forget the right. Anywhere. <laughs> Rarely a bench. <laughs> uh, that was out there for a long time. It's not fun. I advocate for anybody out there, it can happen to anybody. It's not something I planned on growing up. I never saw myself growing up being an addict. I never thought I was, even when I was. I never saw myself growing up to be homeless. I never thought that would happen to me in a million years. I just wasn't exposed to this stuff as a child. So I didn't really know it existed until I was going through it. 
luckily for me. I've had housing for the past four years. I'm dealing with addiction issues head on. Um, I'm currently working at the church. I'm trying to get my life together. But anyway, we'll pass this on to uh, Ricky Ray. We'll keep things going.
Thank you for all coming. Hello. Just check. How are you? I got a file here, but like most people do, take the file and throw it there. Because they don't do no good. Just tell it. Oh, you want me to sell <laughs> You want me to sell They're throwing me out of here. My name's Ted. I grew up in Beverly Farms, small town in Beverly. Can't buy a house where I come from for under $4 million. Come for money. But on my own since I was 15 years old, my mother passed away. I took care of my mother when she had cancer. I took care of my grandparents, same way. But on my own, been in the system that long. What I'm gonna tell you is the system sucks. It don't work, it's been broken for 40 years, and sometimes you just sweep it over here, sweep it over here. It sucks being homeless, sleeping on snowbanks, hallways, ATMs, any way you can to stay warm. It's not fun. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do, and that's life. I've had a hard life. I don't let it, I don't let it kick me down. I've been kicked, beaten, foster homes, had to sell drugs, beaten, stay there today. I just turned 60 years old the other day. Sometimes you dealt five cards when you're growing up, and you gotta make the best of them five cards. Sometimes it's a little flush, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just an ace high. My thing is, I can work. I do have, fortunately I have cancer. Ooh. But I don't let that hold me back. I just need a little help. All of us we need help. We're not asking for a million dollars. We're just asking for help to get on our feet. So we don't have to go out there in the cold, in the rain, worry about going to the bathroom, worry about getting a hot meal. We just need help. That's all I'm asking for, help. I hope you can give it to me. Thank you. or raise your hand if you're needing a break right now. No? Okay. So let's continue this for just a couple more minutes. I think Rico's the one that wanted the break. That's why he said, let's take a break now. I said, no, we're on a roll. This is going. So um, let's see. We still have Shonda. Would you like to come up and say a few words, please? Um, how you doing? Um, I just want to say thank everyone for coming out. It's amazing to see all of these people. I'm just going to tell my story in a brief synopsis, but it's a success story. Um, well, first of all, I'm from Springfield, Mass. I'm a long way from home, but this is my new home. I found family out here in Waltham. Um, back in August 2015, my life changed forever. I was homeless at the time, and mind you, working, all of that, um, I was taking care of my mother. I was a caregiver. She was very ill. Single parent, raised me and my two brothers. Had a great life, all of that. Uh, well, someone decided when I was staying with a friend, we were driving down the street, and someone decided to shoot at a truck as we were passing by these bunch of men who were outside, summer night, everything's going fine. We didn't realize for about two minutes that someone had shot at the truck. Until my friend realized 
or my so-called friend at that time, really wasn't a friend, um, said to me, Shonda, I think someone shot at the truck. I said, no, no, no. And then in the next moment, my head started burning. Right here. And I said, whoo, my head is burning. And when I looked, there was blood all over my hand. But God spared my life. What happened was, it was a nine millimeter bullet. Came through the back of the truck, split in half, one piece went through the headrest, hitting me in the back of the head, landed in the dashboard. The other piece land, uh, went into the bottom of my seat. I might not be standing here today, I might be, would have, would have, have been in a wheelchair. But God let me survive that. Amen. And the uh, bullet didn't come through the seat. But I say that to say that he protected me from all of that. But in the interim of that, my mother was in the hospital dying. The next day, I had to act like nothing happened and go straight to the hospital to take care of my mom. So can you imagine getting shot in your head and going the next day to take care of someone? It was a really, it was just crazy. I'm speechless about that. But I just said that to say how I ended up here in Waltham. I, I probably would have been still in Springfield, but I was born and raised there. I was raised in the projects. Never thought about getting shot. And that's the place where it should happen. But I'm minding my business in a car going to my friend's house and someone decides to be an idiot and shoot and he could have took my life. Don't know to this day, it's almost eight years later, still don't know who did it. Still never got restitution or any kind of closure with that suspect. He's still out there somewhere. He's probably shot up other people. I don't know. But he could have took my life. They treated me as a statistic of society, and I'm not. I'm a strong warrior black woman. And I didn't let that stop me from doing anything I had to do. And he knows you. Yes. So, moving along, unfortunately, my mother passed away that year in October. Had to deal with all that. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore. 2020, during COVID, my friend, thank God for her, she's the one that brought me out to Boston. Then I had to leave there, and I had to come out to Waltham. Never been in a shelter in my life. In my 48 years at that time, now that I'm 50. But at that time, I didn't know what to do. I was numb. But I came into this community, and the community took me in. If you know anything about chaplains on the way, you should know it. Politicians and all. Not just the name. The people who work with it. The people who do things every day. You could be in the office signing a paper, but that doesn't mean you're helping someone. We need people out here to come to the meetings, come to the cleanups. We need the mayor, we need the chief of police, we need the fire department. We just can't, they just can't say, oh, that's nice that they're doing this and they're doing that. But come on out, help us out. I say that to be because I'm a success story and I want all of my people to be successful because I have my apartment. I've been in there a year. And I have to piggyback off of what Mickey said about you get your apartment, everybody thinks that you're just supposed to say, okay, you got your apartment and you go about your life. No, that didn't happen to me. I got into my apartment and I got depressed and sad and alone because I live in Woburn and I don't have a car. I've never been without a car. So I say that because we do need your help from a political standpoint. We can't do nothing without money. And that person who signs those papers to get those grants and those millions of dollars and say they're gonna get subsidized housing and they never do, we need that change. We need people to be serious and about their business. 
and not just say they're the mayor of the city, they're the, they're the police chief, this and that. We need people that's really going to work for us and not against us and judge us. I will never judge a person that's homeless ever in my life again because I've been there, done that, and I've seen what I've seen. And I just ask for the community's help. Everybody has a been hand of a silver spoon in their mouth. It's rough out here. And I just hope that you listen to all of our stories, the good and the bad and the ugly, and just really think about it. When you go home, you go to your nice home, and you maybe buy a fireplace, or you drink in your coffee and sign the documents for the next day in the office, remember the homeless. Remember the people that are sleeping outside. And remember the people that have had success stories like me. Thank you. That was wonderful. I actually got to have a conversation with Chandra last year, and she really is a success story of personal effort in addition to certain parts of the system that she was able to wrangle and get people together to create a success story for herself. And it's, it's a very inspiring one, personally. Um, so we have a couple of other speakers. Were you hoping to say a few words? We all can. <laughs> uh, by the way, she had mentioned uh, yeah, um, these. Yeah, we have everybody jumping for joy. Chandra had mentioned the support, having everyone to come out to help. So there are plenty, even if you don't uh, join us at the Waltham Community Leadership Group meetings. Um, you can get update notes. You can always help out in any way that you can. If you want to come to one of our, uh, like I said, we have cleanups, we have barbecues all summer long. Um, but uh, I don't think the chief of police is here, but I do believe our mayor is here. And I would like to say thank you so much. Okay, so are you ready? <laughs> okay, all right, so we are going to go ahead and take our break right now. Uh, our next speaker will be Milton. people who have no home. But it's not because of them being a bad person. They have, they have no home because there was no support given. <clears throat> community is community, and community is what makes things resolved. So all we need to do is have a strong community, and as we build our community each day, then we survive. People are looking to survive and not to die. Why does it take people having to pass away for anyone to recognize that something was wrong. Amen. This is the issue of the world, not just this town. These things need to be corrected. I'm standing here with this candle, and I light this candle for all of the people who have passed away, whose names that I cannot mention respectfully. But know that each person who's passed away, they are here in this room today along with this speech, and along with this gathering that we have here in this covenant, this day, this evening. Michael. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Michael Perkins and his nephew, Fuse, and Barry. These are a few names that I'm giving that mean the world to me who I met as I was homeless, who became my family. 
It's not about where they're from. It's not about the substance issue. It's not about this or that. It's the fact that they cared, as families should. <laughs> I've made a lot of family. Forget about friends. I've made a lot of family here in this town. And I will say to everyone here, stay strong in the community and let's build together and come together to make this one. That is all. world, honestly, Randall, an integral part of the Waltham Community Leadership Group and Randall. of the Open House Community. Randall. And to add really quickly to what Melton said, uh, while I've been unhoused, I've actually received more help from other unhoused people who had virtually nothing, but they'd give me the jacket off their back or 50 cents out of their pocket, even if that's all they had. We need to change that so that all of us are giving more all the time. I'm going to turn this over. Randall is going to wow you right now. Thank you, everyone. Just a quick story on how I became homeless. Um, I graduated from Harvard Business School, worked in San Francisco, became a CPA worked uh, in a lot of major corporations and I worked as a contractor for a while which means you're a hired gun and once the project is done you no longer have that job but if there's too long a gap then I'm not able to pay my rent and so that happened to me I went to housing court I was evicted and what do I do now I looked online and found the Bristol Lodge. I called up, I got in. It was scary. I've never experienced that. I never expected to experience that. There are 45 men in this cramped quarters and it's extremely difficult. Um, and I just want to emphasize what Ted said. Um, the current shelter is a complete disaster. Amen. Physically, the building, it's unfit for human habitation. It's above a fire station, and there is no accessibility by the handicapped, which I think would be against the law. Um, the staff is totally untrained. There were, a, I can think of three people who were very compassionate and very helpful, but the staff are untrained. They don't know how to deal with homeless people or people with substance issues. And so there's a serious problem of untrained people. And of course, they're paid minimum wage, and so you get what you pay for. And it's, it's a complex issue, but I want to say that it's broken and it needs to be fixed. Yes. Yes. That is short-term solution, but of course, that's not enough. We want permanent housing. And that's even worse. When I first became homeless, I registered at various housing authorities and they said section eight, oh, how long is that? Oh, six years. And of course now it's about eight to 10 years. Yeah. So what do you do in the meantime? You have to live. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's, it's a serious issue, the whole housing issue. And I want to say that um, um, I'm on the front lines. I'm here five days a week serving breakfast and fruit juice and in a warm building. And it adds a lot. It adds a lot to people. And I know that the people are appreciative and um, it's really satisfying. And um, I, Chaplains on the Way has done so much good. They, um, 
are participating in the leadership group, and they also provide a interfaith service, which is the best religious service I've ever experienced. And I went to Amen. I went to church as a kid, but it was never as meaningful as as uh, what I've experienced at the service. Um, the the other thing I want to mention is that there are other people in the community that are seriously studying this whole issue. And so we know that, just like Shonda said, how do you keep your place once you get the key to an apartment? Mm -hmm. And um, so people need to be trained, and the whole concept is train the trainer. And so we are trying to work on detailed plans how to train competent staff for homeless shelters. So um, thank you all for attending, um, and we look forward to moving forward. Thank you. So this is going to be a little transitional period where we're going to move on to the solutions that we're making. I'd love to invite Cheryl up for just a moment. Um, she has been such an integral part in helping Chaplains on the way, and the, the or is it the Waltham Community Leadership Group? Both, both. both. Um, has supported us both emotionally, mentally, and financially to have what we have and keep this going. Um, thank you so much. How humble I feel to stand up here among such strong people. Thank you so much for sharing your stories with all of us, your experiences. I'm Reverend Cheryl Kerr, I'm the pastor at United Parish of Auburndale. We're a federated uh, United Church of Christ and United Methodist Church, and we're right in Auburndale Newton, right on the other side of Mass Pike. Um, we have had uh, a nearly decade-long relationship with chaplains on the way through our um, pastors, through our membership, uh, financially supporting and physically participating in the good work of uh, these communities. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's been a bit of a, a, of a process of, um, of developing this relationship up until this fall um, when we uh, unanimously voted to uh, support um, with a three-year grant the Chaplains on the Way organization, which also supports the Waltham uh, Community Leadership Group. And so it's just an honor to have this opportunity um, for us to not just financially support, but to support with, our, with our, our bodies, with our love, with our compassion, and with our faith. So what drives us as a, as a faith community to, um, to engage in this relationship, right? What is it, why is it that we would dedicate so much of ourselves of our time, of our finances, to this community. And it comes down to one thing. We believe in a creator God, divine spirit, that loves every single piece of that divine spirit's creation. That means all of humanity is beloved. And it cannot be earned. It's not something that you work for. It's there in every piece of our lives and of your lives. And so as people of faith, we see it as our call, as our mandate, to be that love in person, to enact that love in this world. And so what that love has us do is to go into communities and go to one another and care for each other by asking the question, what do you need? And then listening to the stories and the response that comes back. And so this is, this is what we do and this is what we're committed to as a community. Um, I hope that if you are listening, if you're here from a political space or if you're here from a community space or if you think that you might be able to, with your group, partner with this organization, I encourage you to think of that why. Why is it that we ought to partner with chaplains on the way, that we ought to support the work of the Waltham Community Leadership Group? And the reason, the why is, because 
We are all beloved deeply, and we are called to love one another into that belovedness. So thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. I can't wait to see how far this goes, this relationship. I actually forgot, I want to mention one more connection that I have. It's not just through the United Parish of Otterdale, but I am also a representative on the leadership team of something new, a new group called Niche, and that stands for Newton Interfaith Coalition for uh, Housing Equity. And we're working together as faith communities to see where we can get in and use our voice and our people to influence the uh, leadership that make these decisions both in Newton and in our co surrounding communities for the sake of affordable housing and housing for all. So you've got all sorts of connections through me. And I can't wait to help you use it. so much, Cheryl. Okay, so uh, without further ado, one special person I would like to point out here who is not only one of our local elected leaders, but she's also part of the Wellcome Community Leadership Group. So we put her right here in the middle so she could be a good transition between telling these stories, understanding where we're coming from, having participated herself in countless meetings and with her support always. Um, Miss Colleen. <laughs> Thank you so much. So the question that's written up here says, what is home? And we've talked a lot about a physical structure, a roof over your head. I came to volunteer with Chaplains on the Way in 2021 um, during the pandemic, so the vaccines had just started coming out and I was a little nervous. But when I walked in here, I saw home, a place where people were supported, they were nourished with warm food, they were <coughs> in community, and that, to me, symbolized home. And it was home for so many people from so many different backgrounds. And I wasn't just dropping off food, washing dishes, serving food. I was hearing and listening to what it is to be without an actual physical structure over your head. And there are complex issues. This is not something that you can read a book you can't, uh, you know, have someone else tell you. You need to be in it. You need to be embedded in the community and hear what is going on. And I hope that that's something you take away from this experience tonight, because that's what the, the vulnerability, the courageousness of the people who spoke before me are trying to do for you, to give you that perspective of being in the community and embedded in the community to understand. Throughout the campaign, I would meet people like the wonderful Judy Goldberg, and she would ask me, what, are, what is Waltham doing about, uh, to help the homeless in Waltham? And I said, well, Judy, just from my time volunteering at Chaplains on the Way, I can tell you, it's a super complex issue. Why don't you come to a meeting and join us? And that was, what, two years ago? <laughs> a year ago? <laughs> two years ago. And Judy's been a faithful, wonderful volunteer at Chaplains on the Way. And I know, I don't want to speak for Judy, but your eyes, I think, have been open to the level of complexity. So what I want folks to take away from tonight is this is an invitation. These folks that spoke before me are calling you in, and they are saying, come and be a witness to what we have experienced, the challenges that we have faced. And I know many of the people that spoke had the support of places like the Community Day Center, places like Chaplains on the Way, but still had to dig deep within themselves to solve their own challenges. And so, please, tonight, Take that invitation to come, be a witness, 
and use your leadership and your agency within the community, whoever you are. You don't have to be the mayor, but if you are the mayor, great, and take that with you. And if you are a member of the city council, take that with you. But even if you're a member of this community, this is your invitation to use your power and your experiences to shorten those wait times. We can't have eight years be a minimum <laughs> for waiting for housing. Uh, use your agency and use your experiences to shorten those wait times. Increase those resources. We heard it a million times. It's the theme. We need more resources. And I hope that the fact that the folks that spoke before me who really just showed incredible vulnerability had some impact on you in some way to come join us on Tuesdays as a start. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Colleen. Okay, so uh, without further ado, we are missing uh, Miss Nina from the Day Center. She unfortunately has COVID. I hope she's not too terribly ill at home, suffering through it, but she is at home quarantining. But we do have the lovely Carolyn and Alex, two of my favorite people who have helped me out a lot, from the Waltham Community Day Center. <laughs> It's our understanding that there were two questions that we were to answer in five minutes. <laughs> so hopefully we each get two and a half. Um, so the first question is, what do we need to know about the housing crisis? So this is from our perspective at the Community Day Center. Prior to the pandemic, our agency was focused on accessing housing for those individuals who were deemed chronically homeless. According to HUD, the definition of chronic homelessness is a homeless individual with a disability who lives in a place not meant for human habitation, a safe haven, or in an emergency shelter. The chronically homeless individual has been living that way for at least 12 months. So these are the individuals that our agency welcomes and serves. And our housing options prior to the pandemic were provided to us primarily as a result of our involvement with the Boston Continuum of Care, which we all refer to as the COC. Um, and, and that agency holds relationships with other agencies that offer housing, like Pine Street Inn and Advocates. We also worked with the Department of Mental Health and with the City of Waltham Housing Division that launched a program in 2017. And I remember that I was part of that original uh, group uh, to give the unhoused individuals a chance to have an apartment, to work, to um, eventually get to the point where she could move out of that apartment and um, pay market value uh, rates. So pre-COVID, our resources were not only limited, but we were in competition with other agencies and shelters. We learned that individuals were being chosen on a vulnerability basis, which confused our guests as to why some were selected for housing and others were not. In those days, we housed about one person every month or so. That so many of our guests who dreamed of housing but never got called, this is our definition of a housing crisis. Yes. And then the pandemic. Suddenly our phones were ringing off the hook. Individuals who did not align with that HUD definition were now facing homelessness and desperately needed resources. Our clientele began to change. 
The crisis was and continues to be in full force. The lists for state and federal housing have become longer due to the increase in more and more individuals becoming homeless. Emergency housing has a six month wait. We are finding that landlords who used to be sympathetic to poor credit clients will not even discuss a rental without confirming an extremely high credit rating. And finally, the COC is now accepting individuals, and this is good news, they're accepting individuals um, who are not aligned with homelessness. They are, they are uh, housing individuals who are veterans and domestic violence victims, and that is wonderful news. However, the flip side of that, more competition. Hello everybody, my name is Alexandra. Thank you for having me. Um, okay, so I'm on question two, which is what can we do about the housing crisis? So there is no single solution, we all know this, but first and foremost, there's a need for more housing. So we need more local, state, federal, affordable housing. The need for housing just greatly outweighs that which is available, and so housing expansion is absolutely a priority. Um, and as a representative of the Community Day Center of Waltham, we don't want to lose sight of the needs of our clients, and those are the unhoused community who brought us all together here today. Um, and having served our clients in our community for over 20 years, we recognize housing needs to be very specialized and individualized to the people who are being housed. So we work with clients to find solutions that work for them. This means we find success in a lot of different avenues. As Carolyn talked about, we have landlords who we built relationships with who are willing to take on our clients, but we need more landlords who will take on clients who maybe don't have a perfect credit score or a perfect rental history. Um, additionally, we recognize that working with other agencies is something that provides success for us. Other agencies have relationships with our clients, and when we work together, that's when things move much more quickly. And for some, housing alone will serve their will solve their personal housing crisis. But for others, especially those who've been living in shelters or on the streets for years, housing alone is not enough and additional support is needed to have success in housing. And we recognize that by continuing to meet with our clients even after their house, because we know that housing alone doesn't provide everything that somebody needs to continue to be successful. And you know, in my experience of meeting with clients, it can be extremely discouraging when we sign them up for housing and they hear wait lists that can be upwards of 10 years, as we've discussed, and that's really difficult for clients to maintain hope. And I think that is one of our jobs, is to keep clients hopeful and to provide specialized housing opportunities that can shorten that timeline for them. And since we have seen in the last years these wait times just greatly increasing, we've really turned to other avenues to try and find solutions for people. And some of these solutions can be through housing lotteries or through securing housing on the private market, elderly or disabled housing, um, or even short-term solutions such as SROs or rooming houses. And we know we must all continue to work so that we can provide safe and stable housing for all members of our community. And we are so grateful to be here today and be surrounded by so many others who are working together towards this goal. Um, thank you to the chaplains on the way and the leadership community committee, excuse me, for organizing this collaboration. to all of these speakers a lot more that I want to hear from every single one of them and that's why I tried to point out when we first started this this is not the end of a conversation this is not every single part of it we all need to hear more of this I would have loved to let them go on for 10 more minutes right in addition to other speakers so please keep in mind this is the beginning of a conversation to solve a problem please keep this momentum and all of this beautiful work continuing Without further ado, let's see here. Do we have 
Is it Letitia? Letitia. Letitia. Did I? Letitia? Yes. Oh, okay. Wonderful. Um, so is Kay here also? No, he's no? not. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, from our very own Bristol Lodge. Am I correct? Hi everyone, my name is Latasia Blakey. I am the new um, program director for Bristol Lodge Men's and Women's Shelter at the Soup Kitchen. I come from Middlesex Human Service Agency. I have been with the agency for this year will be my ninth year. Um, I just started um, working in Waltham in January. I do come with a lot of history with working with homeless, um, with the homeless. I do come from the, our family shelter in Boston, where I used to run 10 programs with our with our um, family, um, we used to, sorry, I'm nervous of speaking, sorry. But I, I do come from, the, from Boston. Um, I was in the family shelter side of it, so this is kind of new to me, working with individuals. Um, but there are some things that I feel can work on both sides. Um, and that's kind of what I'm going to try to do, bridge that gap from what I've learned in the family um, shelters to our individual shelters. Um, so one thing that I do notice um, just in my short time at Bristol Lodge is that, you know, we need more um, resources for single occupancy housing solutions for our individuals. I know like from the family shows that it's easier to house families with children, there's priorities for them. But I do notice that for individuals, there's not a lot of options. So that is something that I think um, we need to change. Um, also just having affordable housing for individuals. A lot of the in, um, single individuals that I've met so far, I know that they have, you know, they have substance abuse, they have mental illness, they have um, just other barriers that come up in that I feel like even if they did get housing as such some of you have said they need support to get through the barriers to you know sustain housing overall um, I um, I do think that we do also need housing resources for individuals with specific disabilities for veterans specifically and for our elderly population just so that there are different avenues that you know so the way the wait list are, is kind of like vague, it's for everyone. I think if we did have some housing that's just specific for, you know, individuals with disability and veterans, elderly, that we can have kind of shorten those lists um, because now we're focusing on specifics of, you know, trying to help people where they're at. Um, I One thing that I want to bring to the individual side that I've experienced in the family, um, family side of shelter is stabilization services as some of you have spoken about um we in, in the family shelter we do stabilize the families for a year meaning we follow them for a year help them stay you know catch up with their bills make sure that they know how to you know you know pay for stuff how to clean their house how to you know just so that they're not getting evicted one year after they're out on their own um so that is something that i would love to see happen with individuals because like I said, family, it, it, it doesn't matter if you're a family or not, the individual still needs that help. They need that um, that guidance basically to, to, to kind of stay in housing. Um, another thing that I also thought is transportation resources um, such as bus passes. That will help a lot of the individuals um, get to their appointments, get to work, and just, you know, take a little load off of them worrying about finances so that they can kind of move around and get the help that they need elsewhere. Um, I, Like I said, I am new to the Baltimore community. I am new to the individual shelter, but I have done great work in the family world, and I look forward to bringing it here. was nervous and still managed to speak that well. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. It gives us all hope. Um, I get nervous too, so thank you. Uh, let's see here. So, ooh, we have our very own Miss Jeanette McCarthy, the Mayor of Waltham.
First of all, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. And I want to thank you for sharing your heart and for caring. And um, most importantly, for loving each other, for inviting us all here to remind us all that every single day you can make a difference in someone's life. So right now I just want to go over some programs that the city has, and then I'm going to share a personal story, but not a personal story. It's just personal in a way. Um, so um, Bob Waters is not able to be here tonight. He's actually the director of the Housing and Community Development Department for the city. And he's recovering, but Colette Casey Brennan, who's the assistant, is here. So when the warming shelter hit, excuse me, the warming shelter since 2016 has received approximately $100,000 a year in city money each year for the winter season from December to March. And we're very grateful for not only chaplains on the way, but we're also very grateful to the Walden Community Day Center for what they do. So they have received about $750,000. They also received money. They wanted, because there's a certain way that people like to run things, and we know one size doesn't fit all. So Carolyn and her boy, Bob is here as well, came in and said, we like to do it a little bit different way, can we? So then they went out and got some money from the consortium, and then they needed some more money, and then they tried to get the building and everything else. But what I'm going to say is, through their perseverance, they now have their own shelter run the way that they believe the things should be run. And I'm very happy to say that's a, a tremendous success story for all of us. For, so when you look at that model, they have been able to house people in conjunction with their sources, but they also have been working with our housing division to place people all the time. So the Community Development Block Grant provides funding for social service agencies for over 500000 in the last 10 years. Now, I'm going to get away from the facts, and then I'm going to talk to you if that's me. But for the Middlesex Human Service Agency, Bristol Lodge, Mary's Lodge, Soup Kitchen, Pandemic Response, and I heard what you said. I heard what you said. Salvation Army, Community Day Center, Temple Beth Israel, Chapman's on the Way, and Hurley House. Home funds, which are to help you try, try to get a home for 150 to 200,000 a year. We also have a tenant-based security deposit program to assist with the security deposits. Um, and we have a rental tenant-based rental assistant program, the home program, helps with approximately 10 to 15 people experiencing homelessness at risk of being homeless each year. The CDC has been a good partner, so we try to get them into a house and also to make sure they have the support. Now, when COVID hit, we were the first one to come up with the $200,000 with no strings based to it at all. And right away, we put out that rental assistance for the COVID. That almost three million dollars has been given since March 2020 for assistance for rent to keep people from getting homeless. Now, there is a program that's coming out, and then I'm going to talk to you just briefly about some things that I believe in. Um, the West West Metro Home Consortium, which everybody's talking about, the COC is in the process of developing an RFP proposal for $5.4 million federal home ARPA funds. These are special one-time federal funds to address housing needs of those experiencing or at risk of homelessness. Those fleeing domestic violence or human trafficking and other vulnerable populations. Funds can be used for production and preservation of affordable housing tenant-based rental assistant housing, supportive services, or purchase of development of a non-congregate shelter. They have all been through all their needs assessment and they're ready to release their RFP. So a couple things that I'd like to talk about. Sometimes you go to work and you go by and you see somebody who's chronically homeless. You go over and you say to someone, 
Do you want some help? What kind of help do you need? And that starts the conversation. Other times you just have to look out your window and you see the situation. So that conversation begins. And having experience in this, the first conversation usually doesn't work. But then if you ask the question, you may get an answer that you don't like. Nope, we're all set, we don't need you. And then you ask the question again. So at some point, they come back to you and said, you know that time you asked the question, and I'm talking about the housing division or anybody personally, they said, we want the help now. So at that point, once they're willing to get the housing, sometimes it goes like this. First, we have to get them a place to have a shower. Because in order to get them, and I'm talking about people that are in a chronic situation, then we have to get them a medical appointment. Then we have to take care of their um, legal issues that they have. And all during that time, we have to make sure that they don't relapse and come back. Sometimes you have to surrender them. And in my private practice, many times I've had to surrender them because they weren't able to come to that decision themselves to help them in a situation where there was something over. You try not to do that, but a lot of times you have to do it. So I will stand here and say, are there a lot of opportunities in Waltham? Yes, there's a lot of opportunities, but there's much more need than there is resources. However, that doesn't mean that we don't try. For example, the Waltham Housing Authority, I believe in this city right now, we don't need any more luxury housing. What we need, what we need is, what we need is subsidized housing and truly affordable housing. But as you all know, the day that I put the tents in the common, I was greatly criticized. And the state called me and said, you need to help MHSA. And then I called Carolyn and I said, she couldn't open. So the only reason why those tents went up is because I would have had to make a decision that in other people would have had to make. So I made that decision. I just try. I can't say I'm good. <laughs> but, so, thank you, no. I know you a long time. Because <laughs> he knows I know him. I love him. And, you know, and when you have people talking in your ear, like that, which he does a lot, you know what I mean? It does cause you to listen. But, when we understand that affordable housing you could be this close to losing your job, whether it be Harvard Business School or any other place. The rents are the reason for that. And when you lose that job, then all of a sudden, or you get sick, all of a sudden you become homeless. So, but my goal has been from the very beginning is for subsidized housing, which means the people that do not have the means would be eligible for that program by applying, and there should be some things there. Now the governor at the time, Governor Baker, said, I'm going to get all of the homeless out of the hotels, and he did. And the way he did that was no community could deny the application. It was just done. So all of that homelessness from various different communities coming in, so there were certain cities that were in the situation as Walton was, including others, they decided to take care of that. But the same thing goes for whether or not you believe in affordable housing, and no matter what, the definition of affordable is not affordable 
to most people. You need two jobs, you need to have a steady income, and you need to be, have a bank account just in case. So very often what we do in the housing division, and a lot of this we're quiet about, because I do feel that it's a, it's a private issue on a lot of things. So when people come to us, we triage them, similar to what you do. You triage them, and you say, what is it they need the most? And in some cases, it's the addiction that is controlling everything, so they need a detox. Nowadays, you're lucky if you can get a detox for a weekend, a mind 30 days that is needed. So you triage, and then what we try to do is what is it that you need? So what we will do with our funds is we base that and say, okay, when you will pay your rent. Okay, I apologize. <laughs> we'll pay your rent. Oh, serious. We pay your rent until you become age eligible. And while we're paying your rent, we work with everybody to make sure that they're eligible. They go get the application. They do the applications to succeed on that. So I yield my time. But the most important thing I want to thank you for tonight is thank you for inviting me. And secondly, we all have our responsibilities. And I understand that as a human being as well. And thank you. Chaplain's on the way. Becky. Hey. Becky. I know that. You, Steve? Chaplains on the Way has always been a beacon in this matter. Amen. speakers tonight have been fabulous, so thank you to every single one of you who's gotten up here. We would love to hear more and more. I would have loved to let her go on for a whole lot longer, in addition to everyone, so yeah, let's please not let this be the end of anything, but the very beginning of something we were feeling. Um, I do not have my list of speakers. <laughs> Okay, do we have Senator Stanley in the house? Wonderful, I hadn't seen you. You must have been a latecomer. Thank you so much. Oh, I hadn't seen you earlier. Okay. It was, uh, there was no seats available except for the back. It's such a huge crowd, it's awesome. Um, so, you know, I, I've, been, I've been sitting back there and trying to think of what to say, you know, about all the, um, housing initiatives and programs that, as an elected official, I've, I've supported, whether it's on the city council, the mayor went through a lot of that, uh, or at the state level, and, you know, there's many of them, and, and hundreds of millions of dollars, but we know it's not enough, you know, to, uh, it hasn't solved the housing crisis pro uh, problem. But I wanted to, you know, some of you, Mike knows a little bit about me, but if you've moved here from Waltham, we're thankful that you did. You might not know my whole story, and I want to tell you a little bit uh, so you understand, you know, where I come and where we come uh, to these issues as elected officials. Many of you probably know, and I don't mind saying it because the man won't mind, that she grew up in the projects. So she said it many times before. So she has a, a great understanding about, about housing. My parents uh, moved as kids, moved from apartment to apartment to apartment. They weren't homeless, but they moved on and on, losing heat, electricity, so forth. You know, going down the south side, this, this street here, that street, you know, all over. Um, my father's parents died when I think the ages were 12 and 16. And his, his father died from alcoholism. My mother's father died from alcoholism. She'll kill me if I tell you these. You didn't talk about those things back then. Um, and so when they, they graduated from high school and you know, they didn't have anyone else telling them you know, what else to do, they got married and just started working. And uh, they worked two or three jobs for a long, long time. My mother was a waitress at the Chateau for over 30 years. My father delivered the Globe in the morning, went to Raytheon, and uh, worked at a, a, a package store at night. 
Um, so I understand how difficult it is to, to live in this world where it's only got more difficult. Um, I am also a recovering alpha alcoholic. My brother is uh, an addict and been in prison for many, many years. If he gets out, I don't know where the heck he's going to live. Um, and I have other family members that are on the brink of, uh, of being homeless because if they lose their job, forget about it. Um, and so, you know, I, I take all of that um, with me. I take the friendships and the stories I have from my uh, call, fellow uh, colleagues that go to AA meetings every single morning. Um, in all your stories, and I take it to Beacon Hill, and it, and it makes uh, a big difference and it matters in all the decisions that I make. Um, it's frustrating because it hasn't all been enough. Um, we know we still have a huge crisis, and I just want you to know I'm taking all of your stories with me to Beacon Hill with many of my colleagues who keep increasing the funding, but we have to do more. And you're uh, inviting me here tonight, it just reinforces it. It's perfect timing because we're getting into the budget season. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Representative Stanley. So um, we are getting towards the close of the evening. We were supposed to end about three minutes ago, but this is going so well. I hope you all can stay for a few more minutes. One of the reasons why we wanted to have this end at 7.30 is because uh, to get into the shelters, they close at 8. So I'm hoping no one has to leave right now. We can stay for a couple more minutes. We only have a few more speakers. Um, uh, one thing I would like to mention to you, before the end of the evening, before we completely come to a close, uh, I'm, everyone got all of these today when they came in. So one thing that we don't want to let go of is the fact that we all have to do something. So whether it's your personal responsibility to make your life better and those around you, whether it's a responsibility that you have in the community and you do have that responsibility, we all have that responsibility to make this world a better place for everybody. There's something I'd like to, to think about at the very least. If you do have to take off, um, please do uh, try to check out anything that's posted online. Everything has been videotaped this evening and will be online. But at the very least, think about one thing, at least one thing, hopefully it's more than that, that you can do, an action step. It might be something small. It might be um, just that you're your viewpoint has changed and you can have more empathy. We would actually like to have even more than that. If it's making a meal or donating clothes items that you have, working with any kind of community organization that may have piqued your interest tonight that might be a good resource for you, figure out what it is that you can do. One of the best things that I ever figured out to do when I was in a place and I wasn't doing well, I'm not the greatest right now. Help someone who's less fortunate than you. It gives you really good perspective on what it is that you can be grateful for in your own life. And it brings those that may be just below you up a bit and it lifts us all up together. So uh, without further ado, we're gonna move on. Thank you so much for staying. So do we have um, Senator Barrett, was he able to make it? That was a no, correct? Got it. Okay, so, and Bob Waters, she was not able to come tonight, correct? Right, okay. So, um, one of my favorite people here from Watch, Miss Genevieve. <laughs> Thank you and good evening. Who has not been moved? but what you hear tonight, right? I'm Genevieve, and I'm the community organizer at Watch CDC. And as many of you know, we are a nonprofit organization that has been for 35 years in the city, fighting for affordable housing. 
What you hear here tonight is what Watch CDC staff hears every single day. My day starts at 6 a.m. in the morning, like many of you know, because you call me, <laughs> and ends at midnight, as many of you know, because I was with you guys. There's two questions. What is home? For me, this is home now, because now I don't feel alone. Now, I'm going to go and tell my watch colleagues that they are not alone. Because you are here and we are part of this home. With one of those candles, I want to honor my long friend Raquel. Yes. Many of you know her. Probably she was the only soul that worried about us. Not only my organization, Watch, but also three, the Right for Immigration Institute, that many of you here also know. Because she will feed us. And if I have one regret, it's the last time that I saw her, I say no to her sandwich. <laughs> because I had things to do. Let me tell you what we do at Watch, what we have been doing. Something probably that you will understand. We help over 1,500 Waltham residents to prevent homelessness. How? Number one, we create our own fund. We gave away $750,000 in rent, utilities, and emergency housing. We help the RAF program to distribute five million dollars in our city. Watch has assisted to help our own Wartan rental assistance program by helping 450 households. Yeah. All these all these funds are being distributed. That's the past, people. That's the past. All these families right now are having the same issues. Do you know why? Because they work in restaurants, they work in hotels, they work in many other places where they are 40 hours. They were not returned to them. I have clients that they have to work 70 hours in the week. Two hours on Monday, three on Tuesday, Wednesday one hour, and they, if they want it, they can take it. If they don't want it, they can leave. How those families are going to survive? Rico, thank you. I wish I can say more, but it's way too much. Eh, thank you. Eh, we all know that now Waltham is one, is the third highest rent, has had one, the third highest rent on rent in Massachusetts after Cambridge and Boston. So, what this means, that Waltham housing expenses are now more than 103% higher than the national average. And what about utilities? Nobody thinks about that someone that when it rents, they have to pay gas and electricity. That too went up 20% higher than the national average. If you want to find an apartment right now in the city, you go to one of these websites, right? Today, apartments.com lists a studio apartment for over $1,891. One bedroom for $2,600. Two bedroom for $3,057. Three bedroom, $3,900. Why am I mentioning this uh, rent? Because that's not true in Walter. 
I have rental as a, a rent people that are renting for up to six thousand dollars in our city, and that's okay for us. Okay, I'm going to jump because they are pressing me here to what we are doing. What do we need to do? Fourteen months ago, watch, always searching for solutions because. Sometimes we cannot sleep anymore because of what you hear here tonight. We start figuring out what is a thing that needs to happen here in our city to more or less be the first stepping stone towards a solution. We find out that cities like Cambridge, Somerville, and Boston have this tenant notification law. And I said, wow, that's exactly what we need here in Waltham because all these families are about to lose their houses, their apartments, because they don't know that there is funds available. We have the money. Wow. What we want is the information. There is not, we only have 10 people working at watch. And according to the last census, I think we are 60,000 residents, more than half are renters. Do you think that that's human possible? That we can provide this information to everybody that rents in Malta? No, we cannot. I spend most of my weekends walking around Malta, going to synagogues, going to churches, going and asking the school department. I'm going everywhere giving this information. There is funds. There is rough, there is care, there is the, giving all the information, but it's not enough. Right. So we need this law to have this little piece of paper that is going to list all the programs that exist in the city at the federal level, the state level, city level, churches, watch. So we can help these people to pay their rents and their utilities. All, that's all that we are asking. We are not asking for funds. The funds exist. We need to pass this law in Walta. So everybody is informed. Watch, we can update this list with the programs that we have every day. We need to have this law passed. Right now, I think we are going to ask one of the city councilors here present to take it from where they put it and bring it to the floor so we can vote, so we can pass this law. This is not impossible. We can do this. If other cities around us are doing it, why not us? Right, that's right. Okay, I need your help. I need your help. I have templates of letters here for you to sign. We have to pass this law so people can sleep in peace. There is a lot of us that you don't know that they their fear and they are ashamed yes. to ask for help. Yes. Yes. So they can be in their own homes looking at this information and applying without having to call the city or watch to do this or to learn more about these programs. Ladies and gentlemen, the time is now to move from our state of craziness. What is the state of craziness? Not to provide information to the people that they need it. They, we are not asking for funds with this law. We are asking for information. Thank you very much. You were such an incredible public speaker. I wish I had heard that before. My goodness, thank you so much. That was passionate and on point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, is Phil here? Phil Jones, yes. Yes, he is. Okay, so one of our last speakers of the evening to offer 
loves more enlightenment on everything. Sure, you can say that, enlightenment on something. Oh, hello everybody. My name is Phil. I am a lay leader in the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization, or GBIO. Um, it's a hard act to follow, and the mayor, and the senator, and then, and then watch. I, I don't think that in this room I need to tell anybody the value of housing and that the housing crisis touches every single one of us. Uh, but just to change the atmosphere in the room for a second, I want everybody to take a moment and think about where do you feel at home? Or, if you are looking for home, where have you felt at home? What does that feel like? What does the handle of the door of that place feel like? Is there maybe a, a pet, a dog, or a cat there? What does, that, what does that place smell like? And then how far is it to your best friend's place from there? Everybody has deep emotions connected to home. And so we all have a stake in the housing crisis. What we can do and what we try and practice in GBIO is leading with our full self to say yes for more housing. It's sort of a simple thing to say that the housing crisis is battled at every single turn by people who have a lot of time on their hands showing up and saying no. We don't need another shelter. We don't need more housing. We don't want those people moving into our community, whoever those people might be. What we can do is people who are in touch with a desire for home, people with a call for our own home, a love for our own home, is to extend that to neighbors and show up at public meetings, at city council hearings, at Senate hearings, and say yes. I think I'm echoing what a lot of speakers have already said here, but I may be the last one, and I want everyone to leave feeling that your sense of home, your story, and your connection to it is incredibly valued to speak personally, valuable, your ability to speak from the heart on it. Uh, GBIO is not one organization, it's 60. We are churches, mosques, synagogues, uh, the Boston Teachers Union, the Massachusetts Affordable Housing Alliance. We're all, uh, we're a giant coalition of mostly faith institutions, but increasingly groups that are motivated by some form of justice call. And we have a campaign that we're in presently for housing justice writ large. It's pretty hard to steer 60 institutions towards one or two bills a session. So GBIO, you're not gonna often find at the local level saying, okay, we need to organize for 30 more beds in Cambridge, or we need to organize to get one specific zone changed in Lexington. But because we are large enough, um, and we hope that if there are folks here at, that are members of religious institutions, um, you consider joining QBIO, we're large enough that we can work upstream and ask the governor and the Senate president and the speaker for three things. We're looking for three things this, this session. One is a ton of money. All the housing that we need uh, takes a lot of benefits. And it, this sort of state of crazy that um, the, the, the woman from Watch was speaking about before, I lost track of your name, I'm so sorry. Genevieve. Genevieve, the state of crazy that we're in, the money is out there for housing. It's just generally in the wrong places. Um, a, oftentimes people don't know about it, but often it is locked up inside luxury development. GBIO is looking for something called the real estate transfer fee to be passed. This puts a small fee on the selling of high-end real estate, very important in places like Boston and in Waltham and in Somerville, so that a little bit of that money comes back into the community. I live in Boston, a real estate transfer fee for us would generate about $200 million a year. Pretty good. Um, we are also looking to stabilize our state's public housing. In across our 60 member institutions, when you go to coffee hours, when you go to Shabbat dinners, you find out that there are people who've grown up in public housing everywhere. Uh, we were, They were referred to as the projects earlier. The projects, to me, feel like something from the 50s to the 70s, but public housing is still here. It is all around us, and it is a vital first step 
towards getting transitioning from homelessness into permanent housing. There's about 40,000 public housing units at risk statewide, and, and GBIO is pulling together tenants and housing authority directors and building managers to say, we need billions of dollars to protect the public housing we've got and to build more, because it's a program that has worked really well in the past to house people and keep people safe and connect people with that, that feeling of home. So, GBIO is working in a number of different areas. What all of you here can do is keep in touch with the folks in this room. Remember that you have power as a storyteller and as an advocate. Show up to the city council meetings, call your representatives, and I I'm, think I'm gonna steal Jill's mailing list and invite those who indicated interest to a big old GBIO meeting in a couple of weeks as we start building the power to get the billions we need for public housing, to get real estate transfer fees passed, and to start moving some of that money and that power around into the places that it should be. So, yeah. thanks for letting me know. Uh, that was wonderful. I no longer have my paperwork here anymore. I'm a little bit lost. I'm pretty sure Mary McCarthy stole it from me. <laughs> Not on purpose. Um, so we are going to finish up for the evening. Randall is going to close us out. I want to talk about next steps. You have all seen the, uh, the action pledge paperwork. Please fill it out. Um, it's really important because that's what we want to do is define what we're going to do next. Um, I know that um, you have learned a lot and seen some of the complexity of the issues that we're dealing with. We are, um, we want to announce Housing Summit 2, it's going to take place in October. It's going to be, we have spent three intense months, many, many people, to produce this one today. And, and so we an equal amount of work into Housing Summit 2, but it's a very different approach. What would, We've been mostly today having a lot of experts and people who have spoken about their personal experience talking to you so that you can gather this information. Now we want to have you participate with a group of similarly motivated people and try to come up with constructive solutions. So it will be organized, we'll work out the details but we want to have groups of people who will talk and uh, discuss an issue and come up with what that table recommends and then another table and then we want to summarize it as a group and try to come up with the next step in terms of constructive solutions. So that's, look forward to hearing from, uh, you know, if, if, if you left your contact information we will let you know about the details of Housing Summit 2, which will be sometime in October. So um, thank you so much for attending, um, and um, thank you for all of the wonderful speakers, and we really appreciate um, the commitment that you have shown. Thank you.